Good morning. Good to see everybody today. I ask you to take your Bibles and turn to Jeremiah chapter 1, uh, and we'll look at a text there in just a moment. But while you're doing that, I want to uh, thank you for coming today. It's an awfully cold day, but you felt the, uh, the importance of being here with God's people, and we're grateful for that. And especially uh, if you happen to be visiting with us, we are truly grateful that you've come our way, and we would invite you to come back and be with us anytime you have opportunity uh, our opportunities are limited right now due to the pandemic, but every time uh, we meet, we'd be more than happy to have you with us. And so come back. And we want you to know, too, that we are uh, always open to your questions and comments. If you have them, if you see or hear something in these assemblies you don't understand, uh, let us know about that, and we'd be happy to discuss it with you. In Jeremiah chapter 1, I want to look in particularly at verse 10. Uh, God is speaking to Jeremiah. In fact, the, the, the section here, verses 4 through 10, uh, is where God is calling Jeremiah to his prophetic ministry. But uh, I had that section uh, carved out as a reading because I was really wanting to get to verse 10. And God tells Jeremiah, he says, See, I have set uh, this day you over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down, to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. Now, this is talking specifically about Jeremiah and not Jesus, but we see here Jeremiah has been put in a position to destroy and then to build. And that's interesting to me to think about that. We don't often think of it in those light, and especially when we think of Jesus, we don't usually think of Jesus as being a destroyer. We think of Jesus as being a savior. Uh, he's called the Prince of Peace. And so many times we have a positive spin, and rightly so, upon the Son of God, but we have to remember that before there can be any positive, there has to be sometimes some negative. And that's what God is telling Jeremiah here. Uh, he talks about uh, in his ministry, he was going to be rooting out and pulling down nations. And he's going to be doing that not in a literal sense. Jeremiah is not literally pulling down nations, but he's doing it through his message. The message that he preaches, telling the nations to repent uh, or face the judgment of God. And so his preaching was designed to destroy and then to build. And the principle, of course, that is here is something that we all, all realize, but we don't stop and think about it, and that is this. Before any uh, constructive rebuilding can occur, there must be some demolition. I was trying to think of some illustrations of this, and I thought of this very church building. You know, several years ago, probably about 15 years ago, uh, this building didn't sit here. There was a house on this lot, and the brethren who met at Fishers decided they were going to erect a building, and they purchased this lot. Uh, that had a house on it, and they began constructing. Now, to do that, they're going to have to tear up the ground. They're going to have to break the ground. That's what they usually call it, a ground breaking. And so they tear up, and there was a house setting back there. And that house had to come down. And so before there, the building that we have here could be put up, there had to be some destruction, you see. And I, so we know that. We know that uh, instinctively, but we don't often think about that. And the same thing is true spiritually speaking. Jesus Christ wants to rebuild your life. Think about that for a second. Take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and I'm particularly uh, interested in verse 17 of that chapter. And he says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away, Behold, all things have become new. You yourself are the work of God. You yourself are the new creation of God. New things have come into your life, but in order for those new things to come, there had to be some old things that were destroyed. There had to be some old things that were uprooted and torn up, you see. And, and, and so before Jesus can be our Savior, Jesus has to be our destroyer. We have to understand that a lot of people, they want a religion that's easy. They want a religion that doesn't ask much, much of them. Uh, but we have to understand that before Jesus can be our Savior, before Jesus can rebuild our lives, before He can bring all things new to us, Jesus has to be our destroyer. We have to let Him destroy those things, uproot those things, tear out those things that don't belong, those things that don't please God, those things uh, that lead us on a pathway to destruction. We have to uproot those things. And so that's what I want to talk to you about. And I want to look at it in a broad perspective sense. I, you know, we could focus just on the individual, but I want to look at it in a broad perspective sense. I want us to think about this morning the ways in which Jesus has been a destroyer. And one of the first ways 
uh, and that I want to think about is the fact that Jesus destroyed a rebellious nation, actually destroyed many nations in the past, but I'm speaking specifically here of the nation of Israel. Take your Bibles, turn with me to Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12. And Jesus is talking here in parables, but the people who are listening are very perceptive and they understand that he's talking to them. Look at verse 12, Mark 12 and verse 12. It says, They sought to lay hands on him, but feared the multitudes, for they knew he had spoken the parable against them. So they left him and went away. So they were very perceptive. Even though Jesus is speaking in parables, they got the point. And they understood that Jesus was talking against them. But now let's go back and let's read the parable, starting with verse 1. It says, He began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it, and dug a place for the wine vat, and built a tower, and leased it to vine dressers, and went to a far country. This is God uh, building the nation of Israel. That's the imagery here. In fact, you can find the same imagery in Isaiah chapter 5. In the first uh, four, five, six verses there, you find the exact same imagery where Israel is described as this vineyard. And, and, and God prepares it and does everything and sets everything up, and then He goes away. And it says, at verse 2, At vintage time he sent a servant to the vine dressers, that he might receive some of the fruit of the vineyard and from the vine dressers. And they took him and beat him and sent him away empty-handed. Again he sent another servant, and at him they threw stones, wounded him in the head, and sent him away shamefully treated. And again he sent another, and they, him they killed, and many others, beating some and killing some. Uh, what Jesus is describing here is the sending of the prophets. God sent, we were studying the minor prophets before the pandemic, if you'll recall, and God sending His prophets to the nation of Israel to uh, warn them and to uh, encourage them to repent. And they mistreated the prophets, and they beat them, and they killed them, and, and they opposed the prophets. They didn't want to hear this. God says, I've set you up with this great vineyard, and I expect some produce. I expect you to produce something for me, and you're not doing it. So He sends the prophets, and they destroy them. Then verse 6, it says, Therefore still having one son. I wonder who that might be. The Son of God, you see, Jesus Christ, having one Son, His beloved, He also sent Him to them, saying, They will respect My Son. Oh, but that's not what happened. It says, Those vine dressers said among themselves, This is the heir, come let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they took him and killed him and cast him out of the vineyard. That's the death of the Son of God. And Jesus is speaking in parables, but they're beginning to see the picture here that our history doesn't look very good. And it's been a history of us rejecting the word of God. Therefore, verse 9, Jesus said, What will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the vine dressers. Look at that word destroy. That's our lesson. He will come and destroy the vine dressers and give the vineyard to others. Jesus destroyed a rebellious nation. He's talking here about the destruction of Jerusalem, which took place in the year A.D. 70. But notice very carefully in verse 9, He will destroy the vine dressers and He will give the vineyard to others. There's a change that takes place. A move from the physical nation of Israel to the spiritual nation of the church, the church of the living God. And so there's a shift here that takes place. And the destruction of Israel made way, made room for the church to shine, you see. And this is the picture Jesus had. In order for the church to shine in all of its glory, the nation of Israel had to be destroyed. They had to be destroyed because of their rebellion, because of their wickedness, you see. But this serves as a prophetic warning to the rest of us today because this judgment is just a type and a foreshadowing of another destruction that will come also. Take your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew 22. Back up just a little bit in your Bibles. In Matthew 22, Jesus is telling the same story, but He's using a different parable. Now, He's using a parable of a wedding feast. Instead of a vineyard, a parable of a wedding feast. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I'm going to pick up the parable in about verse 6, because that kind of lines us up with where we left off in Mark chapter 12. It says, The rest seized His servants, treated them spitefully, and killed them. There's Israel, their history of rejecting the servants of God, rejecting the prophets. And then verse 7, when the king heard about it, he was furious. And he sent out his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. The destruction of Jerusalem. 
in the year A.D. 70. Jesus sent those armies out. The armies were the Roman armies, the Roman Empire, but Jesus used them. They were at His behest, at His call, and He sent them out and destroyed Jerusalem. And some, might, some have argued, some of my brethren, a small uh, faction of my brethren argued, that's it, that's the end of it. Oh, that's not the end of it at all. Continue reading. There's more. There's much more. Then he said to his servants, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. The Jews were not worthy. They had to be destroyed. I had to get them out of the way, you see. Therefore, go out into the highways, and as many as you find, invite to the wedding. There's the church, the bringing in of the Gentiles, and the expansion of the church. And those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all whom they found, both bad and good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment, and he said, Friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. And the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot. Take him away and cast him into the outer darkness. And there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Jesus destroyed a rebellious nation, Israel who had a history of rebellion against God from the very inception, from the very beginning. All they wanted to do was rebel against God. And he said, all right, enough is enough. In order for my true people to shine, those who truly follow me and are truly faithful, I must destroy that rebellious nation. And they will shine. But let that serve as a warning that there is yet another judgment to come. And we'll talk about that a little bit later in the lesson. But Jesus is a destroyer, isn't he? We sometimes forget that. We forget the negative aspect. We forget that things have to be rooted up and destroyed before positive things can come, you see. That's what we need to learn about Jesus. There's something else that Jesus destroys. He destroys human wisdom. Did you know that? There's a lot of human wisdom out there in the world. Wisdom of men, not the wisdom of God. Man, mankind tends to think he's so smart and so wise. Mankind tends to think that he knows everything, but we know nothing. Uh, compared to God. He is far wiser and far more intelligent than we are. But take your Bibles. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We'll begin the reading in about verse 18 or so. The Apostle Paul says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. Notice that same message. It's the message of Jesus, the message of the cross, His death, His burial, His resurrection, the message of salvation. And He says, some people look at it and say, that's a bunch of foolishness. And others look at it, and the light bulb goes off in their head, and they say, I get it, and I understand, and I see the power of God in this. And so you have two reactions to the same message. And He goes on in verse 19, and He says, For it is written, He quotes here from the Old Testament, I will destroy, and there it is, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. You see, Jesus destroys human wisdom. It was written in the old law. And Paul says it is being fulfilled before their very eyes as the gospel goes forth, as the message of the cross goes forth. It destroys human wisdom, destroys the wisdom of the wise. He goes on as he builds his case, verse 20, Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? You smart people, where are you at? Show yourselves. Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. Worldly wisdom we think sometimes is so high and mighty and so wonderful, but we need to recognize it doesn't hold a candle to God's wisdom. We need to recognize that worldly wisdom needs to be laid aside and we need to accept the wisdom of God. The, the message of the cross can destroy all kinds of human wisdom. And I, I'll just mention a few here. Atheism, that's human wisdom. And you know those, if you've ever talked to an atheist, they think they're so smart. They think they're so wise. They've got it all. Oh, I know. I just know there's no God. You couldn't possibly know there's no God. You might believe there's no God, but you couldn't possibly know that because the only way you could know that is to know everything there is to know and to have been every place there is to be because the one thing you don't know or the one place you haven't been might just be where God is. So you can't possibly know that there's no God. You believe it. And so it's worldly wisdom. It is not human I mean, it is not divine wisdom. It's human wisdom. And the message of the cross can destroy that. If we just, if we just uproot the human wisdom, stop listening to those who would ridicule the Scriptures, to those uh, who would make light of Jesus and His message, to make light of Jesus and His sacrifice. Secularism. We live in a secular world. More and more, the world is leaning towards secularism. And the idea is basically is God is out of the picture. God can't be included in the picture. 
We relegate God to the church buildings over there. All you crazies can go over there to the church building, but we don't want to hear God's name mentioned anyplace else. Don't do it. That's human wisdom, and that's a bunch of foolishness, and that's not the way to run a world, and that's not the way to run people's lives, and yet that's what we see. But the message of the cross can destroy that human wisdom and help us to see the folly of that, the folly of secularism, where there are no real answers, where life is nothing but a joke, really, under secularism. There is no God and there is no judgment and there is no purpose. And secularism just leads to misery. And yet we're smack dab in the middle of a secular world and going more secular all of the time. Right along the heels of that, evolutionism. Your kids are taught that in school, by the way. Did you know that? They're taught that. They're taught that you're nothing but a glorified monkey, that you're just a descendant of apes. Now, they don't like it when you say monkey, uh, but, but uh, you're just a descendant of apes, and, and that's, that's the truth. They don't like the language, but that's the truth. That's what they're saying. That's what evolutionism says. And we're living in a world, listen to me carefully, that wants to deify science. Listen to me. Now, people say, got to follow the science. Okay, I'm fine with that as long as it's not junk science. There's junk science out there. Evolutionism is junk science. There's nothing factual about it whatsoever. Think of, just think of it from a standpoint of reproduction. Everything reproduces after its own kind. People have known that for generations. Evolution comes along and says, no, 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 that's not true. A dog can become a horse, which can become an ape which can become a human. Really? That, that flies in the face of genetics, doesn't it? That's junk science. That flies right in the face of genetics. And so Jesus has to destroy human wisdom. We have to lay aside the atheism. We have to lay aside the secularism. We have to lay aside the evolutionism and the deification of science and accept God's wisdom. Before we can build our lives after the wisdom of God, all of that human wisdom has to be uprooted and it has to be destroyed. And Jesus is just the one to do it. He's just the one. He has the wisdom. He has the knowledge. He has the power in His Word to do that very thing, to uproot human uh, wisdom so that He can rebuild our lives according to the wisdom of God. And I've learned over the years that the more we grasp divine truth, get your nose into this book, people. The more you grasp divine truth, the less appealing the human wisdom is. You begin to see the folly of it. You begin to see the folly of atheism. You begin to see the folly of secularism. You begin to see the folly of evolutionism and all of the junk science that's out there. And you begin to, to glorify the wisdom of God. And it changes your life in ways that you can't possibly imagine. It changes your outlook on life. And so Jesus, the great destroyer, He destroys human wisdom. He's still doing it today. And He's doing it with the message of the cross, with that Bible you're holding in your hand. That's how he destroys human wisdom. Now let's get a little closer to home. Jesus destroys the works of the devil. Take your Bibles. Turn with me to the book of 1 John, chapter 3. 1 John, chapter 3, and I'm going to read verse 8. And the writer, the Apostle John, says this, He who sins is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. There it is, destroy. You see, Jesus, the great destroyer, he destroys the wisdom of the wise. He destroys human wisdom. He destroyed that rebellious nation of Israel. And here, he's going to destroy the works of the devil. That was his mission. That's why he came into the world. How does Jesus do that? How does he destroy the works? We, we sometimes get this idea that there's going to be this massive army. In fact, premillennialism, that's just what they think about. They think of it in literal terms, a massive army and a big battle, the battle of Armageddon, they tell us. And, and so they, they've got this all figured out in their minds as though it were some kind of literal thing. Jesus destroys the works of the devil through his death on the cross. Think about that. Turn with me, if you will, to the book of Hebrews chapter 2. And the Hebrew writer makes it very clear to us. We're going to look at verses 14 and 15. He says, verse 14, Inasmuch as the children have partaken of flesh and blood. Stop. The children here are the children of men. Humanity, if you please. And we all partake of flesh and blood. That's part of our makeup. We have a spirit within us and then a body of flesh and blood. And so, as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, He Himself, Jesus, likewise shared in the same. He partook of flesh and blood. 
He came to this low land of sin and sorrow. He put on human flesh and became a man, you see, so that he might die for our sins. In fact, that's what the rest of the verse says. He shared in flesh and blood that through death he might destroy him. There he is, the great destroyer, Jesus the destroyer. He might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. You know, prior to Jesus coming into the world, the one who had the power of death, according to this verse, was Satan, wasn't it? We're studying on Wednesday nights in a Zoom class, the book of Revelation. And in chapter 1, it was pointed out that Jesus made the statement, I think it's 118 if I remember correctly. In Revelation 118, Jesus says, I have the keys of death and of Hades. In other words, you know what he's saying? I got the power now. Satan had it. Satan had the power of death, but I have destroyed him. I have destroyed his power. And now I have the keys of death and of Hades, death being the grave, Hades being the realm of the spirits, where our spirits go. And Jesus did this through his death, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of the devil, uh, uh, had the power of death. And so Jesus destroys by, and again that goes back to what we said earlier, the message of the cross. Had all, look at how it all goes back to the Bible. It all goes back to the scriptures. It all goes back to the word of God. And Jesus the great destroyer. And, and think about those works. The works of the devil. You've done them. I've done them. We've all served the devil in our lives. That's the, only, that's the reason we needed Jesus to begin with. We have served the devil. We have said things we shouldn't say. We have done things we shouldn't do. We have had thoughts that shouldn't be in our minds. And we've defiled ourselves. And Jesus came to the world. I'm going to destroy that so that I can rebuild you. So that I can make you a better person. So that I can make you in the image of God so that I can uh, do some holy construction in your life. Take your Bibles, turn to Colossians chapter 3. And here he, he, he describes just a little bit of that demolition, that destruction. Colossians chapter 3, I'm going to start the reading with about verse 8. In fact, just for a little context, let's go all the way back to verse 5, just for some context. Therefore, put to death, stop, that's another way of saying destroy. Destroy. Put to death your members which are on the earth. What are you talking about, Paul? Fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Those are the works of the devil. He says destroy them. Put them to death. And you do it through Jesus. You do it through His death on the cross, through the forgiveness offered by His blood, you see. But you've got to do some, you've got some skin in the game. You've got to put those to death in your own life. Because of these things, verse 6, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. Think not for one moment that you can live in these sins and not face the wrath of God. He says, for because of these things, these works of the devil, the wrath of God is coming on the sons of disobedience. You cannot escape this unless you come and do it through Jesus. In verse 7, he says, In which you once walked, in which you lived in them. That's what I said earlier. We've all served the devil in our life, haven't we? That's the reason we needed Jesus in the first place. We've all, we've all been engaged in the works of the devil at some point in our life. We all have. That's the, that's the reason Jesus came. I want to destroy those works. I want to root that out of your life. I want to get that stuff out of your life. The fornication, the uncleanness, the passion, the evil desire, the covetousness. I want to get that all out of your life. I want to destroy that and uproot that and replace it with something much better. Let's keep reading. Verse 8. You must also put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, Filthy language out of your mouth. Some of those things we, we human beings classify as little sins. Filthy language, a lot of people say, no big deal. It is a big deal. It's the work of the devil. Put it away. The anger, put it away. The wrath, put it away. The malice, put it away. Do not lie to one another. A lot of people talk about little white lies. This says don't do it. Don't do it at all. Do not lie to one another. Since you put off the old man with his deeds, and here comes the kicker, and you put on the new man, here it comes, who's renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Uproot the works of the devil. Get them out. Put them away. Put them to death. Do it through Jesus. And then replace it. And be reborn. And rebuilt. And reconstructed in the image of God. This is the mission of Jesus to each and every one of us. And he came. He's the great destroyer. And he came to destroy the works of the devil. In order to rebuild our lives, he has to destroy, if I can use an expression, this expression actually comes from the Bible, the fly in the ointment. 
The old fly in the ointment. You've, that's, that's in the book of Ecclesiastes. The fly in the ointment is the devil. The devil and his influence. The devil and his works. And he gets in our lives and he messes us up. And that's got to be uprooted. That's got to come out. If it doesn't come out, you can't be recreated. You can't be new in Christ, you see. And so Jesus, the great destroyer, has to come in and, and, and uproot all of that stuff. And once again, how's he do it? The message of the cross. It's the message. It's tied to the scripture. This is how he's going to destroy the works of the devil. This is how he's going to uproot all of that stuff out of your life and replace it with something new and positive. Now, as we move on, don't get too comfortable in this old world. We sometimes do, don't we? We like it here. And we want to stay here just as long as we possibly can. But know this, you can't stay here forever. And that brings us to our next point. Jesus is going to destroy temporal existence. <laughs> I mentioned at the beginning how that you had to uproot the ground and, and tear down the house on this lot to build this building. But you know what? This building ain't going to stay either. It's going to burn one day. This planet on which we stand is going to burn one day. He, he is going to destroy physical, temporal existence. Turn your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And I don't want to delve deep into Paul's larger point here. I just want you to think about something that he says here in verse 13. Just the first part of it here. Foods for the stomach and the stomach for foods. That has to do with our physical existence, doesn't it? We eat food, we put it into our stomach, it nourishes the body. Foods for the stomach and the stomach for foods. But he says, know this, God will destroy both it, foods, and them. The stomach and the foods, the physical existence, God will destroy. It's all going by the wayside. Your house is going to burn. Your car is going to burn. Your bank account is going to burn. Your insurance policy is going to burn. This building is going to burn. Your clothes are going to burn. Physical existence, Jesus is going to destroy it. Why? Because i got to tear all that down before I can build you a better place in heaven. Understand that? you got to have some holy demolition. got to have some things destroyed. Before you can have a better place, you got to have some destruction here. Turn your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. And Peter was addressing some who doubted that Jesus would come back. And he, he assures us in verse 10, the day of the Lord will come. It's not might come, should come. No, it will come. Mark it down. It will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise. The heaven, that's the stars out there, the moon, the stars, the planets, all that stuff you can look at through a, a telescope. And some of it you can't even see because it's so far away. And, 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 and all that stuff, it's all going to pass away. And the elements, the very building blocks of this world and this universe, will melt with fervent heat. The earth, this planet, and the works that are in it will be burned up. Some translations say discovered or laid bare or exposed. But the idea is it's not going to stay here. Jesus is going to destroy it. He's the great destroyer. He's going to destroy a temporal existence. Don't get too tied to this world because it isn't going to stay here forever. Wasn't meant to. Wasn't designed to. That's not the purpose. Therefore, verse 11, since all these things will be dissolved, it's going to go then what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Rebuilding those lives, uprooting the sin, uprooting the works of the devil, because everything's going by the wayside, even this very planet itself. Looking and hastening the coming day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, even though that's true, we, according to His promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. There's a couple of words there I want you to notice there. He says in verse 12, looking for and hastening. And then verse 13, we look for. This, this, the destruction of this material creation should not be something that disturbs us. That's just what, that's going to happen. Deal with it. It's going to happen. And it has to happen to have a better place to go to, a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells, you see. The old has to be destroyed before the new can replace it, you see. And so it doesn't profit us to get tied to this temporal existence, does it? You're here and you got to serve the Lord. Everything else is just kind of not that important. 
We have to understand that. We have to realize that. Jesus talked about in Matthew 13, verse 22, how the cares of this world, this temporal existence, and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. God can't rebuild your life the way He wants to if you're too tied to this temporal existence. God can't rebuild your life in the image of Him who created Him unless if you're too tied to this temporal existence. That's why the Apostle John says in 1 John 2.15, Do not love the world or the things that are in the world. We get too tied to it, don't we? Jesus, the great destroyer, is going to destroy it. Know that. Understand that. And live your life accordingly. Finally, it's important to understand that Jesus will destroy the disobedient. Examine yourself this morning. Are you in Christ? Are you outside of Christ? Have you obeyed the gospel? Are you lost in sin? Understand that Jesus is the great destroyer, and if you're disobedient and you're lost in sin, He will destroy you. You need to know that, because that's motivation for you to let Jesus destroy these other things in your life so that you can be rebuilt in the image of God. Turn your Bibles to James chapter 4. Interesting statement that James makes here in verse 12. He says, there's one lawgiver, that would be Jesus. There's one lawgiver who is able to save, oh and there it is, and destroy. Did you see that? That's what we're talking about. Jesus the destroyer. And he is able to save and he is able to destroy. And know this, he will. He will destroy. He has to destroy. That's part of his work. There is one lawgiver who's able to save and destroy. Who are you to judge another? This destruction that we're talking about here will come after death. Oh, think about that. Many times we think death, that's the end. Death is the end. It's not the end. It's just transitioning to another phase of your existence. As Brother Roger Schaus puts it, just going through a door from one room to another. That's really all that it is. We are terrified of it. We shrink from it. We do everything in our power to avoid it. But it's coming. And it's not the end. It's just a transition from one room into another. That's what death really is. And if you, if you go through that door into the next room and you're not prepared, if you're disobedient, then you will face a destruction that's far worse than death. Turn, if you will, to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 28. Jesus says, Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. We get that backwards sometimes. We do fear those who can kill the body. We're scared to death of that. We think that's the end of all things. If the body is killed, that's it. No, that's not it. Don't fear those who can kill the body and cannot kill the soul, but fear Him, that's Jesus, fear Him who is able to destroy, there's our word, destroy, Jesus, the great destroyer, who's able to destroy both soul and body. Oh, think of that. People say, well, I thought the soul is eternal. Yeah, but this is a destruction. This is an eternal destruction. Think of that, an eternal torment. An etern that's what destroy really means. It means to ruin, to utterly ruin. And if you go through that doorway of death and you're still disobedient and you've not obeyed the gospel of Christ, He will destroy your body and so you'll be resurrected on the last day. So you'll have a body. And that body and that soul will be destroyed for all eternity. Everlasting torment. Everlasting punishment. Jesus, the great destroyer, you see. It comes after physical death. It's worse than physical death. And the reason is that before God can send us to that heavenly paradise, remember, He wants to rebuild your life. And the reason He wants to rebuild your life is so that you're fit to enter that heavenly paradise. You're not fit in your sins. You're not fit to enter the heavenly paradise in your sins. And so He's rebuilding your life so you'll be fit to enter that heavenly paradise. But before you enter that one, this, one's, this world's got to go. And the disobedient have got to go. The disobedient have got to be destroyed. They've got to be purged from heaven. They got to be purged from the presence of God. I got a, a couple of sermons I preach. I've preached them here before in years past. He one's on heaven, one's on hell. And they're titled, they're, they're, they track with one another. One is called Hell, 
the absence of God, and heaven, the presence of God. And you stop and think about that, that's exactly what heaven and hell are. And that's exactly why hell is hell. Because in hell, you are away from the person of God. You will never see Him, ever, for all eternity. You are away from the person of God. You are away from the provisions of God. Right here, right now, you've got provisions. You've got sunshine. You've got a roof over your head. You've got a job. You've got a family. You've got God's provisions right here. He makes His rain uh, to fall on the just and the unjust, you see. Sends his son on the evil and the good. You got it. But you get over there in the, in the bad place, <laughs> no more provisions. Absence of God's provisions. Absence of God's place. You won't be in where God is. God's in heaven. You won't be there. And absence of God's people. You'll never see another Christian ever again. The best people on the face of the earth. The people who know right from wrong. The people who know the pathway. You'll never see another Christian again, ever. That's why it's called hell. The absence of God. The destruction of the disobedient. All of that has to happen because Jesus has to make ready for this ultimate eternity for all of us. He wants you in heaven. And to do that, there has to be some holy demolition, some destruction that takes place before He can rebuild our lives in any meaningful way. There has to be some things uprooted and destroyed. There's an old saying. We've all heard it before. Before you can make an omelet, you have to break a few eggs. Have we heard that expression? We, we understand what that means. There has to be some destruction before there can be co some construction, some positive, you see. And so we're going to have to let Jesus break a few eggs. We're going to have to let Jesus destroy the eggs of human wisdom. Let Jesus destroy the works of the devil. Let Jesus destroy temporal existence. Let Jesus destroy the disobedience. Uh, don't resist it because it, you, it's not resistible. You can't resist it. So don't even try. Don't even bother. Just let Jesus do the demolition so that He can prepare you and build you for a better place and a better home. Where are you at this morning? We're going to sing a song of invitation. If you find yourself outside of Christ, if you find yourself among the disobedient, you can change that. That's the beauty of all of this. You can change that just like that. And you can be set on a different pathway, on a pathway to heaven. Let Jesus uproot the works of the devil in your life. Listen to the word of the cross. Believe that he is the Son of God. Repent of your sins. Confess his holy name and be baptized. Behind me the baptistry is ready to go. Warm, clean water. Garments you can change into. Towels you can dry off with. The Lord has done his part. We have done our part. And the only thing missing is you. If you're subject to the invitation, come right now while we stand and while we sing.